In our last episode on Fallout 3, we fully explored the Nuka Cola plant in the Capital Wasteland, only to discover a secret pre war recipe for Nuka Cola Clear. The R&D team at the Nuka Cola plant in DC had spent a lot of time developing this recipe, only for the project to be cancelled by Brad Burton himself after the Project Cobalt team dropped Nuka Cola Quantum in his lap. So they stored the formula in a wall-mounted safe. While exploring the plant, we found the body of a raider named Mercier who had been sent to the plant to recover the Nuka Clear formula. On his body, we found a note telling him to retrieve the formula and bring it back to a man named Goli Ledoux who was waiting for him at the Red Racer factory. The note said that Goli Ledoux had found a buyer for the formula, which would give he and his gang enough money to play in the big leagues. After thoroughly exploring the plant, we managed to recover the formula, and now we head to the Red Racer factory in search of Goli Ledoux. We find the Red Racer Tricycle Factory just north of the Nuka Cola bottling plant. Both buildings are deep in Raider territory, and we'll have to fight through dozens of them just to walk from the Nuka Cola plant to the Red Racer Factory. Once we finally arrive, we see a group of men standing outside the front doors to the factory. And as we approach, we are stopped by none other than Goli Ledoux. Hold it right there. What are you doing here? Now these guys are raiders, and if at any time we insult them in any way, they turn hostile. For example, if we respond right now by saying, none of your damn business. Penalty? That's gonna be two minutes in a box for you. I some guys. Goli Ledoux and his raider gang turns hostile. Thankfully, we've got Sharon to flank them. On Goli Ledoux's body, we find Ledoux's hockey mask. This unique hockey mask has a damage rating of 4 and grants the wearer plus 25 additional action points, which is equal to that of having the Action Boy perk. That's an extra attack or couple of attacks in VATS depending on the speed of the weapon we're using, and because of that stat alone, it's a very useful hat item. Additionally, Ledoux's hockey mask is impervious, it never wears out, which means we'll never have to repair it, saving us a boatload of money on repairs. I read, however, that this is a bug, not a feature, and might not appear on every platform, or may be fixed, depending upon the mods you have installed. But let's assume for the moment that we don't want to kill Goli Ledoux outright, and instead we want to finish our conversation with him. Instead of goading him into violence, upon first meeting him, we can say, Hey, take it easy. I was just passing through. Don't take slap shots at me like that. We saw you come out of the Nuka Cola plant, and we know you've got the formula. Now you gotta make a decision. Go for the power play, or sit in the penalty box. Look, I just came to tell you that I found your friend Mercier, and sadly, he's dead. But I did retrieve the Nuka Cola Clear formula. Mercier didn't make it? Damn! How do they expect us to play when we don't even have enough people on our team? Well, as long as you brought the formula, I guess we're still in the game. All right, I gotta ask, who exactly are you and why are you talking like that? And what's with those hockey masks anyway? The name's Goli Ledoux, and I'm captain of Sudden Death Overtime, the last of the ice gangs. There was a time where every city had their own ice gangs, and thousands would show up to watch them all duke it out in giant arenas. We aim to bring those days back. <laughs> Sounds like this guy, like Mo Cronin in Diamond City, doesn't quite understand how pre-war sports worked. Well, okay, if you say so. Now look, you gonna sell us that formula, or do we have to face off? I'm putting 250 caps up on the scoreboard. What do you say? Well, Captain, are we gonna fight or try to make a deal? That's up to you. We can make a deal? Or we can face off. Can I think about it? No, no, no. When you're in the game, you have to make split-second decisions. Think on your feet. Now come on! We now have to make a choice. We can, of course, say, screw it. I'm going for the face-off. Well, you're a little short-handed. But you showed up for the game. The least I can do is make sure it's a short period. Ice some guys! 
in which case they all turn hostile. Or we can accept his offer outright by saying, fine, I'll take it. Or we can pass an easy speech check to say, hey, make it 400 caps and it's all yours. Nicely played. And I know talent when I see it. Here you go. Okay, team. Let's get out of here. In which case, they give us 400 bottle caps and leave with the Nuka-Cola Clear formula. But you know what? These raiders would have killed me if I didn't have the formula. And God knows how many people they've already killed, so I don't have any qualms with taking their money and then reducing them to ash. If we do on their bodies, we do find fingers if we have the Lawbringer perk, and we can loot Ledoux's hockey mask and recover the Nuka-Cola Clear formula. Now, even though the note we found on Winger Mercier's body in the Nuka-Cola plant said that Goli Ledoux had a buyer lined up, we never find out who that buyer is. If we take this formula to Sierra Petrovita, she doesn't say anything about it. If we take it to Abraham Washington and Rivet City, he doesn't say anything about it. There is no one in this game who is willing to buy this from us or who expresses any interest in it at all. So if we take it back, we can use it as a player home decoration, and we'll always wonder who exactly was the buyer who wanted the Nuka-Cola Clear formula, and what would they have done with it? If it was some kind of pre-war military tech, I could conjure up a host of villains who might want it, the Enclave, or even Mr. House, and the Institute. But this is just a soda drink formula. Who could possibly have wanted this? At any rate, now that we've dealt with Goli Ledoux, we've got this Red Racer factory to explore. As night falls, we see a flickering light partially illuminating the big Red Racer sign above the door. And once ready, we can enter through the front door to the factory floor. We arrive in a poorly lit lobby. We see three doors, but first let's loot the lobby. After looting a first aid kit, hiding behind a countertop to the west, we can look through the two northern doors. These appear to lead to the same factory floor illuminated by a soft red light. And then we can turn east to see a ruined hallway. We'll explore east first. Immediately to the left, we find a locker room. There's nothing inside, but while we were there, Sharon killed a glowing one in the next room. We can peek into that room where the glowing one was, but we don't see anyone, so we can turn on our light. The hallway next to it is filled in with rubble. In this room, we can just loot a bunch of containers. In a box on the ground, we find some mentats, but that's it for this room. So turning around and going back down the hallway, we can cross the lobby and go through the doorway to the west. In this hallway, we see some pre-war displays from the factory. We see models of some of their tricycles on pedestals on a shelf, and some more toys, including a teddy bear that we can save for little Marie, but we get spotted. And another one lunges from the next room. Whoa, was that a mine? Did you hear that? It sounded like a mine beeping for a moment before this head exploded. Oh, that was weird. Maybe I'm just hearing things. This room was a small office, but we don't find anything here aside from containers to loot. Heading out and going to the end of the hallway, we see a door to the west and the hallway rounds a corner to the north. Going into the western room first, we find another office. In one of the cubicles, we find an easy locked safe. And when done, we can go out the door to continue exploring down the hallway to the north. At the end of the hallway, we see a staircase to the left filled in with rubble. So our path continues east. But as we go down, we find another split. The path continues left past some wrecked generators, straight ahead, or we can go west to loot some scrap on a work desk. Here we just find a few boxes. Turning around, looks like if we were to go east, that would go to the factory floor. I wanna go there last, so instead, we'll head north past those wrecked generators. And this leads to another fork. We can go north, northeast, which again appears to lead back to the factory floor. We see some red on our compass. There must be some ghouls that way. But I wanna explore this western door, which also has red on our compass. So it looks like there's enemies that way as well. And sure enough, as soon as we creep forward, there you are. You like that? 
looks like there's one more in this room, but I don't see him there on the factory floor. We can loot a Nuka Cola machine to the left, and then peering through the window, we see red racer tricycles on a conveyor belt. Creeping around the corner, we can go down some steps to the factory floor. We see lots of trash and garbage all over the place, but not a whole lot of loot. We discover here that there appears to be a variety of factory floors. In fact, this factory is an absolute labyrinth, one of the most confusing mazes of floating pods, catwalks, scaffolding, and ruined rooms that I have yet seen in Fallout 3. It's going to be tricky to give you a play-by-play -play narration of this dungeon. I'll do my best to keep it as clear as possible. It may help if I label each of these big rooms, so we'll label this one we just explored as Factory Floor A. Once done, we can head back up the stairs. We passed a doorway earlier that led to to another factory floor, but I believe we can access it by going east, past some water fountains, and then turning north. This leads to factory floor B, and we can take care of some more ghouls. We clear the floor, but we keep hearing more ghouls walking around the rafters above us. Sure enough, Sharon races up to find one. Ow! Come on, Sharon, be more careful, man. Oh, well, I think we finally cleared it. After looting the containers on this ground floor, we can head on up and turn south to find a storage room of some sort. Here we just find lots of containers and buckets and boxes. There are two ammo boxes on a shelf to the southwest, some railway spikes hiding in a wooden box behind some Abraxo cleaner on the bottom shelf of another. Now before we go up the stairs, we do see a doorway leading out of this pod to the north. So heading out that doorway and turning a corner, we see two big garbage cans, and one is filled with a bunch of wooden boxes. We see one ammo container in there. Oh no, which means these boxes are likely hiding something. We can take these out one by one, and sure enough, we do find another ammo box hidden at the very bottom. Continuing east down the hallway, we see that this opens up to yet another factory floor. We'll call this one Factory Floor C. We can take care of some ghouls and the scaffolding above. We see another conveyor belt to the left. There are plenty of ways to navigate this room. We can go up a staircase leading up, up a small ramp, and then down again leading to a door to the north, or we can go out another door to the south. Gosh, this is such a maze. We'll go south for now. Here we find a snack station rounding a corner. We can loot one vending machine and an Etotronic. In the Etotronic, we get two doses of jet. The pod turns south and leads to a door to the right filled with ghouls. We'll call this Factory Floor D. We hear more ghouls, but we don't know where it's coming from. So heading down the hallway and turning left, we see them in an adjacent room. We didn't have a chance to finish exploring that Factory Floor, so heading back to Factory Floor D. Ouch! What was that? Where did that come from? And looking above, we see a catwalk spanning the perimeter of Factory Floor D. That must have been a ghoul reaver, but we don't see him up there. Maybe he ran down to try and attack us. Well, he's gone for now, so we can finish exploring. But disappointingly, after checking every one of these wooden boxes, we don't see anything in here. Big disappointment in Factory Floor D. We can then head out and then turn left into that room where we killed those two ghouls. We see that it must have been a kitchen or break room of some sort. There are ruined tables and seats 
everywhere. Opening a door to the kitchen, we find two boxes of shotgun shells on a shelf. Strange thing to have in a kitchen. And we can loot a first aid box on a wall to the east. The kitchen opens south to a hallway. There's a bathroom to the northeast. Checking each and every one of these stall doors, we can hop up to make sure there's nothing in any of the water tanks. In one, we just see a skeleton. But strangely enough, in the final stall, we see a fire hydrant? What? We can drink from this, so it is connected to the water main. Doesn't make any sense. There's a carton of cigarettes in the water tank of a nearby stall and another skeleton, but that's about it. Heading out and going down a western hallway, we see that this does a big loop. There's some scrap to the left, and going right down the hallway goes back to the break room. So instead, we'll go west. This leads to the largest and most complex factory floor, which we'll call Factory Floor E. We see a pod on the other side, pods floating above, stairways going up, scaffolding floating at the top. Turning north, there is a workbench here. In a stew pot on the bottom shelf, we can find two fragmentation grenades. There's a bottle cap mine resting on top, as well as some microfusion cells. This pod is a big L going right through factory floor E. So continuing down the pod, we see that there's another part to this factory floor to the south. And then in the middle of the pod, we see a whole bunch of storage, but sadly nothing in any of these boxes. The pod then turns north to another section. We see two exits out of this, a ramp to the east into factory floor E, and then a pathway west going god knows where. There's some leather armor in a footlocker here, and we find some dirty water in a stew pot on a counter. There's an ammo box at the bottom of this shelf, and here the pod ends. Retracing our steps, let's finally enter factory floor E to see what's in here. Looking above, we see steps and catwalks crisscrossing this way and that. We've got our light off just to make sure ghouls don't get us, but it's so hard to see. I have to turn it on periodically just to see where I'm at. We're hidden, but we see ghouls running around above us. They zip in and out of these floating pods. It's hard to get a bead on them. So instead, we can quickly loot some containers on this ground floor to the west. We find some railway spikes in one of these boxes and a small box filled with darts. There are more railway spikes hiding behind some Abraxo cleaner in a box. Oh, and here they come. see him moving on my compass. I can hear him, but I just can't see the guy. Where is he? Come on, man. Show yourself. There he is. Well, with that, we've given away our position and the other Reavers find us. can't get a good shot on this guy because of the catwalk. Thankfully, these Gauss rifle shots do splash damage, so even if I'm just hitting the railing here, at least I'm whittling down his life. But he escapes through a doorway, and he never came back out, so we need to get out of factory floor E, heading back up the stairway, going across the ramp to the west. This path to God knows where actually brings us back to factory floor A. We see the corpse of the glowing one we killed earlier, and that vending machine we looted at the very beginning. Finally, we're starting to get some sense of direction here, so we've done a big loop. Okay, so this means we've fully explored this ground floor. We now need to find a way to the scaffolding above, but there's no stairway up here in factory floor E. So instead we wind our way through this maze until we arrive again at factory floor B. Here we find that stairway where we killed a glowing one earlier that leads all the way up to a big floating pod. At the top, we can turn left or right or go straight. Going straight leads to a catwalk where we find some shelves, but then Sharon gets attacked. Like that. That takes care of that. Whew, for a moment there, I was afraid I had shot through Sharon to kill this guy. Thankfully, he's alive. There was nothing in any of these boxes. We can continue by going west down the pod. We see that this opens up to the east, to that same catwalk that we explored just a minute ago. Here we just find some barrels and boxes. So heading back into the pod, we can continue west. This leads to another snack area. We find an Etotronic on the wall, and a Nuka-Cola machine to the right with some quantum inside. And this leads to a catwalk overlooking factory floor A. 
the very first factory floor we found. Turning right, we can go up some stairs to a platform at the top. We just see a bunch of tools laid around. So turning around, we can go to the south-southeast. We see a door to the south. I'm guessing this may lead either out or to some sort of boss of this dungeon. But I want to finish exploring first, so instead we'll turn east. And heading east leads to a catwalk above factory floor E. But before we can explore this, let's go through a door, which leads to more scaffolding overlooking factory floor D. This was that small factory floor where we got surprised by some goo thrown by one of those ghoul reavers, but then he ran off and we couldn't find him. We need to be careful, there are some hidden holes in this scaffolding. Turning left to the north, we find a small bathroom here, and we just find an ammo box on the ground, and a first aid kit on a wall. We can continue to the east, go down to the south, which turns to the west, where we find a dead end. But turning around, we see a bunch of stuff stacked on top of that pod. Oh, great. We're gonna have to jump down there to explore, which means we have to wind all the way back up. So jumping on down, we find an ammunition box. We can then go up a small ladder to find some Radex, a bottle of purified water, and hiding under a bucket, a copy of DC Journal of Internal Medicine. Okay, so it was worth it. But now we gotta find our way back. I'll spare you the long run back. Needless to say, we retrace our steps and head back to the scaffolding above factory floor B. We hadn't explored this yet. We walked right through it. Going to the east, we find some scaffolding that goes down and around the perimeter and then across a pod, which then goes up across another pod and back to where we were. So it just goes in a big loop, which means the only way forward is to go south, up some stairs that cut through the middle of the pod, Turn left. Here we find a bunch of boxes next to a fire extinguisher, but nothing in them. Continuing to the south, we can round a corner where we end at a small generator on top of which rests a radio and some bottles of whiskey. So we've explored every factory floor, every floating pod, and every catwalk above every factory floor. Ah, good. This leaves one place left to go. Retracing our steps back to the catwalks above factory floor A, we can head to the south and finally go through that door, which we discover leads to the CEO offices. As soon as we enter, we hear a familiar background ambient noise. This is the very same evil chanting we heard in both Dunwich and the ritual site of Point Lookout. We learned in our video on Dunwich that this voice is chanting the word Alazared, Alazared, Gieth. We know from Dunwich that this has something to do with the supernatural, dealing with ghouls. Well, we just cleared a factory filled with ghouls. Maybe that has something to do with it. We see a stairway to the right filled in with rubble, so we can continue down the hallway to the west. We see a doorway to the north and... Behind us is an average locked door, and we find another door to the west. But creeping into this northern room where we killed the super mutant first, we can loot some minor containers. We find some buff out in a box to the south, an ammunition box on the bottom of a shelf to the east, and right by the door on a table to the south, we find the chip broadcast terminal. It's locked with an average lock. After hacking it, we find two entries, the first diary entry L2. I have used materials from the small explosives cache I found to further safeguard myself from my experiments. I have wired the building to broadcast a signal from this terminal that in an emergency will detonate all of the chips. I pray that day never comes. The next option is to disable all chips. And if we choose this option... We hear that familiar mine sound and tiny bloody explosions deeper in this building. With this room explored, we can head out to the south. And before going down the hallway to the west, we can unlock the average locked door to the south. This leads to another storage room with more containers. We find a first aid kit on one of the middle shelves here. And then three ammo boxes on some shelving against the wall to the south. And on a shelf to the southwest, we find a copy of Nikola Tesla and you. With these rooms explored, we can continue down the hallway to the west. Opening this door leads to a large vaulted room. What a room! We see the dust of ages floating in clouds towards the ceiling. The roof is weakened and cracked. 
we see sunlight from outside pouring down. This must have been a resplendent room in its day. The walls are still covered in fancy wallpaper, but all of the framed portraits have been burnt or cut away. We see stairs leading to a loft level. There's a door at the top, and then a passageway to some bathrooms to the south, and a hallway to the north. We pass through a doorway to find an already dead super mutant master, and his head is missing. I think that by deactivating the chips in that previous terminal, we somehow detonated some explosive chips in the brains of these creatures. Someone has placed explosives in the brains of the super mutants and ghouls infesting this building. But who? And for what purpose? Near to this corpse, we find some shelves covered in boxes. Of note, there is one ammunition box. There is a big crackling generator in this room. And passing it to the east, we see a table covered in some sort of chemistry station and a terminal. Surgeon's notes. The terminal is locked with an average lock. Inside, we find two more diary entries. The first entry 2RA0, the first ghoul chips. Some of my earlier chip prototypes, C6A and C6L, have started to malfunction, causing the chips to overheat and eventually detonate the implanted charge. In retaliation, I have upgraded the P7 series and above to counter the malfunction. I have also altered the V2 series in the mutants as a precaution. Ghouls are easily replaceable. Mutants are not. In the next one, entry 64D, A3. Mutant Chips. I have had to alter the chips for the mutants to account for their greater size. Fortunately, they exhibit a higher intellect than the ghouls and can be controlled to an even greater extent. The enthralled mutants have mentioned legends of even larger mutants, almost twice as big as the ones I have captured. If only I could get my hands on one of those, the experiments, and I believe this person meant, would be much more fun. So these chips are not just explosives, but also mind control chips. Whoever's doing this was having a hard time controlling the feral ghouls due to their limited intellect, but the mutants had a higher intellect, allowing this person greater control over them. Heading back down the hallway and looking up, we see that there are some small office cubicles on this floor. Let's explore these first before we go upstairs. There's an ammo box on a shelf to the southwest and two more on the other side of this cubicle wall on a shelf to the west. Turning around and looking up, we see another pre-war tricycle display on a shelf overlooking the door. These people must have been proud of their work here. Next, we can head down the hallway to the south. We find the ladies' restroom to the left, but it's really badly destroyed. Nothing in here. And then the men's restroom to the west. We find a bottle of whiskey, but that's about it. All that is left is to creep up the stairs to that balcony and to head through the door. As soon as we open the door, we get charged. His name is the surgeon. He was holding a flamer. But he goes down fairly easily. But was that a vault suit he was wearing? Heading inside, we see big electric generators all over the place. There is a door to the south, and we see a red line on our compass heading down the hallway. We find a ghoul behind a cage. Get a mess with me. The ghoul's name is Stefan. Even though he can't reach us, Sharon decided to take him out. Well, with the enemies dead, we can fully explore this room. We find the surgeon's corpse lying on a bloody heap in the middle of the room. On his body, we find a finger if we have the Lawbringer perk, the flamer he was using, the surgeon's key, and a unique outfit, the surgeon's lab coat. This unique item only gives us a DR of 2, but it gives us a whopping plus 10 to medicine and plus 5 to science, making it one of the best lab coats and scientist outfits in the entire game. It's better than Dr. Lee's outfit. It's only rivaled by Lesko's lab coat. Lesko's lab coat, however, only grants plus 10 to science, but it has plus 20 to radiation resistance. It's missing any medicine skill at all. So Lesko's is great for those who prefer science, and the surgeon's is better for those who prefer medicine. But unlike many of the lab coats in the game, this one is worn over a vault suit. There are only two other vault lab coats in the entire game. 
One is on Jonas, whom we met in Vault 101, and the other is on a hostile scientist named The Survivor in Vault 106. But of course, both of those people are in vaults. What is this surgeon doing wearing a vault suit? We can use his key to unlock a wall safe by his terminal to the north. Inside, we find a small stash of caps, and then we can unlock an average locked surgeon's terminal. Inside, we find notes on Stefan. A diary entry 07C. Stefan. My masterpiece. Stefan is now under my control. The latest chip I installed in him seems to have taken, and he is now mine. The effort to catching one of these glowing ghouls was immense, but finally I can take solace in the fact that I have one under my control. His limited intellect means that I will have to keep him downstairs with the rest of the ghouls, but I pity any rabble that pokes their heads in here now. Strange that he says this as we don't find him downstairs, but instead in this cage. Maybe he had finished writing this just after successfully implanting the chip and hadn't had a chance to move him downstairs yet. The next option is to disable all chips, which we had already done in the previous terminal. We see evidence that the surgeon had been experimenting on wastelanders. We find a wastelander corpse splayed out on an operations table in the middle of the lab. We can use the key to open a floor safe to the southwest. We find more caps and pre-war money. There's a first aid box on a nearby shelf. Rounding the corner, we can explore the wall across from Stefan's cage where we find an ammunition box on the ground, and we can then use the key to open the gate to Stefan's cage. On Stefan's body, we find one rat away. There's a Nuka-Cola Quantum on some rubble in the north corner of his cage, and we see that Stefan had been feeding on a Wastelander body. So the surgeon had been kidnapping Wastelanders, experimenting on them, and then feeding them to Stefan. At the end of this hallway is a door to a supply closet. In one of the boxes, we find some Mentats and two doses of Jet. On the other shelf, we find some darts, two packages of railway spikes, and an ammunition box on the bottom. There is some Medex and some Buff Out on his kitchen countertop. And in a bathtub filled with human remains, we find two boxes of shotgun shells. Now, as we saw, the surgeon is hostile as soon as we find him. But if we have a ghoul mask that we get from the Ten Penny Tower quests, the surgeon is not hostile if we wear it. However, he has nothing to say. I'm not in the mood for you, asshole. So how can we explain this? There is sadly a striking lack of backstory behind the surgeon, so I cracked open the official Fallout 3 strategy guide to see if it told us anything more. And I learned that the surgeon's ultimate goal was to better understand the brain patterns of ghouls and super mutants, but not just because he was a curious scientist, but because he wanted to sell this information to the highest bidder. The guide also told us that in addition to the mind control experiments he did here, he conducted radiation experiments. We don't really see any sign of his radiation experiments in the CEO offices, but perhaps these radiation experiments may have something to do with the strange chanting we heard in the CEO offices. We already know that Un Qualtoth reaches out to humans that have been touched by radiation. Maybe Un Qualtoth had detected the surgeon's radiation experiments and was in the process of trying to get him under his control when we arrived. Well, here's the best story I can piece together based on the evidence. I think the surgeon must have come from a nearby vault. I don't know which one. I don't even know if it matters which one. Perhaps after leaving his vault, he realized that the vault Tech Corporation was long gone and there was no need for him to continue with his original experiment. And so he set out to conduct his own experiments. Perhaps vault Tech had him working on some sort of mind control chip, and he thought that he could use this technology for his own purposes. He takes over this tricycle factory and then brought in a lot of the tech from his old vault. This may explain why we see a lot of these generators that we typically only find in the reactor levels of vaults, especially such a high concentration of them here in his lab. He also dragged up here all of the medical and surgical equipment from his vault. He was an unscrupulous scientist who kidnapped and murdered anyone whom he found to be useful. He would use them for his own experiments and then feed them to his pet ghouls. This is why he was hostile as soon as he saw us. At least by killing him, we have made the capital wasteland a little bit safer. As we leave and return to the lobby, 
we realized that in our exploration, we never found the factory floor on the other side of these two main doors in the lobby. We'll go ahead and call this one Factory Floor F. Heading inside, we find a really small assembly line. Taking the stairs down to the ground floor, we find a bunch of boxes we can loot. Nothing really interesting inside, though we do walk away with a lot of railway spikes. Heading back up, going west and turning the corner, we see two barrels. On the other side of this railing, we can use these barrels to leap up on top of this floating pod. Here we find a small stash of goods stored, a purified water in a box, and a copy of Dean's Electronics by a toolbox. On the other side of the fire extinguisher, we find a Mentats. We also notice for the first time, a giant tricycle hanging from the rafters in this room, upon which is seated a larger than average teddy bear. We can loot this teddy bear by sneaking up behind it, and it retains its size. This means we can use it as a very large teddy bear decoration in our player home. However, if it stacks with any other teddy bears, it loses its unique size. So before looting it, it's important to place all other teddy bears we're carrying on a companion's inventory. Then to make sure that we place this as a decoration in our player home before looting any other teddy bears. Additionally, if after placing it in our player home, we pick it up again and then drop it again, it loses its size. So after placing it, we can't loot it again. Back at factory floor F, if we go down the western doorway, we realize that this pod connects to that hallway with the big blasted out generators, which in turn turns and leads to factory floor A. So there we go. We have now fully solved and understand this crazy, crazy labyrinth. What are your thoughts on the Red Racer Tricycle Factory and Goldie Ledoux? Who do you think could have been the original person who hired Goldie Ledoux to retrieve the new Coca-Cola Clear formula? And where do you think the surgeon originally came from? Do you like the story I concocted, or do you have a better explanation? Let me know in the comments section below. I have new shirts in the shop today! Lawbringer! I think I even mentioned in a previous video that I thought it was strange when you would incinerate an enemy, turn them into ash, but if you have the Lawbringer perk, you still find their fingers that you can turn in for the bounty. So I've got a shirt here with a big pile of glowing ash and a finger resting on top of it. Beneath the ash is the words Lawbringer, but I had an idea, so I created another shirt that says, tap that ash. I know, I know. I can hear your collective groan from here, but... I saw the opportunity, and I had to take it. For those who don't like either of the text, I also have a plain version with just the image. The shop has a bunch of other stuff, including my suspenders set to maximum stun shirt, as well as shirts with my face on it. You can even get a mug with my mug. You can browse my shop by clicking the link in the description or by clicking here. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week on a wide range of topics spanning all of the games. So if you want to make sure you don't miss my next episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video. Don't touch. You can talk. Don't touch. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, K, J, A, L, L, T, B, T, O, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. I want all my ABCs. Next time I do save with me. Good job. Your turn. No, oh, no.